es amor de verdad, nadie lo puede dudar. Step up to craft beer. Taino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing Caribbean style flavor. Borico Craft Ale, full bodied flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Taino Craft Light Lager and Borico Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm and come up to craft beer. Advocate, I am you. Florida residents call toll free 866 341 1425. Step up to craft beer. Taino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing Caribbean style flavor. Borico Craft Ale, full bodied flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Taino Craft Light Lager and Boricua Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm and come up to craft beer. Hi, I'm Danny Ramos and welcome to this week's edition of Hispanic Speak Out TV. We've been on the air for 16 years here in Central Florida and we are now statewide thanks to uh, Spectrum Cable. They're taking uh, our programming across the state so we can continue to inform the bilingual Hispanic community of all the issues and leadership um, people that come on the air to tell us uh, what they're thinking. And tonight, we have a really special guest, a real big brand name in our community. His name is Bill Sublette, and I'm sure you've heard of Bill Sublette. He's very attached to the educational system of Central Florida. And he's running for uh, mayor of Orange County. Welcome. Thank nice you, having Danny. you here, Bill. Well, nice thanks for inviting you. me on. And this is uh, Greg Perkins. Greg Perkins uh, does the EDU show with us, which is our education programming. And he's come on to ask Bill some uh, questions about education because they both have that kind of a background. So the first question I got for you, let's get right into it. Um, three issues. Um, what are the main issues affecting Orange County in the next couple of years? What are like the three big thrust issues that are going to affect the county? That's a great question. I, I think we have a number of challenges in our community. Uh, one is uh, poverty is a very, very big challenge, and it's something I'm talking an awful lot about in this race. As school board chair for the last uh, seven years, I've really seen firsthand the effects of poverty. Our homeless population has grown from about 2,000 students a short six, seven years ago to over 6,000 students to today. And, and I think one of the things that we need to do in county government that we really can tackle well is uh, for too long, governments have tackled or, or, or addressed the symptoms of poverty. And we need to continue doing that. By the symptoms, I mean food programs, social service programs, but all too often we don't attack the root causes of poverty. And I would suggest to your viewers that one of the root causes of poverty is a lack of adequate jobs, a lack of entry-level jobs that have room for advancement where somebody who is a hardworking, uh, whether it's an evacuee from Puerto Rico, whether it's someone who has migrated here from another state, whether it's somebody who's been born and raised here, or some uh, job that they can move into and they can move up the ladder, so to speak, and, and make a good wage. But we also need a dedicated funding source for our transportation system. I always tell folks that it's no good to have the jobs if the folks who live in the higher poverty neighborhoods can't get to the jobs. And as somebody who's worked with high poverty populations and with children throughout my career, I've been a children's advocate for over 20 years in this state and in this community. I know that the jobs are wonderful, but if you can't get uh, the, the, the mountain to Mohammed, so to speak, if you can't get the employee to the job, then all the jobs in the world won't do a darn bit of good. So we need to have a dedicated funding source for our transportation system. You know, I, when I'm out there, I'm talking on the stump, Danny and Greg, I, I love to talk about my vision for Orange County. And my vision is a community where, where every uh, mom and dad has uh, sidewalks and, and parks that their children can play in, where moms and dads can get in the car and drive gridlock free to a, to a good paying job or to get on a mass transit bus and get to that job where we can live in a community that's hardened against hurricanes because I think that's become the new normal where we can uh, endure a hurricane as I think we're going to do more and more often and not lose power for weeks on end as, as is so often the case. And, and, and a community where every resident feels safe in their homes. When I'm out there, I'm talking to folks on the stump, I, I ask a rhetorical question all the time, do you feel safer today than you did five years ago, than you did 10 years ago? And, and a lot of folks, frankly, most folks say no, they, they don't. So we, we have a lot to accomplish here in Orange County. I'm following a great, a great mayor, a mayor who has a record of transparency and highly ethical government, and I hope to continue in that tradition. But I also hope to bring my skills as a child advocate and as someone who has a vision and the energy and the experience 
of having run the 10th largest school district in the country along with a great superintendent, uh, that experience to county government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My, one, of my, one of my favorite um, topics is kids. You know, I'm a guardian at Lightham. I've been for many, many years. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm dedicated to that. And um, it always confuses the hell out of me that we have so many kids living on the streets that are, there's 26,000 homeless people in Central Florida, and we're supposed to be the mecca for children worldwide as far as entertainment goes. How do you put that together? I mean, to have, like you said, 6,000 homeless children in Orange County. Well, the number of homeless total is projected to be 26,000, but that includes adults. Mm -hmm. um, how does a politician justify that as an ongoing um, illness of our, of our society? Well, I can't, I, I can't answer how a politician uh, justifies that because I think it's unjustifiable to be very kind, candid with your viewers, and I think it's unconscionable. Um, and I think that it disproportionately affects minorities far more. When we look at our homeless population in Orange County, I was just looking at the numbers the other day, the proportion of the homeless that are of Latino or Hispanic heritage or the proportion that's of African American heritage far outweighs those of, 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 of the white race. So my, my point being that uh, homeless really disproportionately affects minorities far more than it does uh, other other groups in our, in our country. Um, I've also served as a guardian ad litem for over mm -hmm. 60 Good. children wow. in, in wow. my career. I haven't for the last few years, but mm -hmm. uh, I, over the years, literally 65 children I've been a guardian ad litem for. Right. And, and I've seen firsthand the effects of that abuse and neglect and, and, and of going without uh, resources, going without food on the table. And it puts tremendous stressors on our families. I think that we need a government in the county that really makes it a priority to tackle an issue. You know, one of the things I, I shared with somebody who called me today on an issue, and they, and they wanted to talk about children's issues. A little bit about me for, for your viewers. I chaired the statewide campaign, Five Promises to Children mm -hmm. campaign, was part of the children's campaign. I uh, chaired the Blueprint Commission on Juvenile Justice. I was actually one of the architects of the juvenile justice reforms in our state when I was in the state legislature back in the 90s, rewrote the entire juvenile justice code. And, and one of the things that I, I, I share with folks all the time is uh, when you're in office, you have to decide what your priorities are. And I always tell folks, and I shared it with somebody on the phone today, uh, tackling multi-generational poverty and tackling children's issues is a top three priority for me. It's literally that important to me. And I think it's, uh, your, your, your viewers are going to find that after hopefully with their support win this election, that one of the first things that we're going to do, if not the first thing, is bring together a, a task force of community leaders, subject matter experts. They're gonna have a very simple, clear mandate. And that mandate is going to be, I need you to come back and we need to build consensus about how we're going to find a dedicated funding source for our transportation system, a dedicated source of funding for our children's programs in this community, and how we're going to really address bringing jobs to this community. And one thing that I differ from a lot of candidates on, Danny and Greg, is candidates love to come in here and talk about high-tech, high-paying jobs. And don't get me wrong, that's important. But that's not going to solve what, 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 what ills our, uh, our community faces. That's not going to solve our problems. Because so many of the folks who are battling to get out of multi-generational poverty are not candidates for those high-tech, high-paying jobs, which mm -hmm. all, all too often require a four-year college degree and require an extensive level of training, if, if not even a postgraduate degree. Mm -hmm. We need to still keep going for those jobs because the because rising tide does lift all boats. But at the same time, we've got to understand that we need to bring light manufacturing jobs to this community, jobs that pay good wages. We need to bring jobs where there are room for advancement. Uh, from entry-level wages into higher wage-paying uh, uh, opportunities. Mm -hmm. We need to realize that the job search can't be solely centered on high-tech uh, industries that we've got you know, to bring when, for When I folks. was a kid, and that's a long time ago, okay? that's a long, <laughs> long both, time ago. <laughs> no, not so much you. Um, when you were in high school, when you were going to high school from a middle school, from a junior high school, and you were going to high school, they gave parents and kids a choice that you could go to a trade school, you could go to aviation, you could go to graphic trades, you can go to electrical trades. So when you graduated high school, you were going into a, a predetermined apprenticeship program where you were already being paid a decent wage coming right out of high school. And you because, had a nice skill. Yeah, and you had a skill that could be brought to a higher level, but you had the basics coming right out of high school. And somehow, as society went forward, that started to disappear because it became politically incorrect not to offer everybody a college education. Mm -hmm. Even though 
they weren't ready for college or even though they didn't want to go. Everybody wanted everybody to go to college. Yeah, you're right. And you're I right. think that we're in a situation now and you can you know, where we gotta go back, like you were just saying, we gotta go back to service trade jobs and those kind of things. I'm agreeing and, with and, you. And, and let me chime, chime in yeah. here. Uh, Bill, Bill, how do you do that uh, with the homeless population in terms of making sure that they, they have the education and the skills to get at those jobs? But is that going to cost a lot of uh, uh, money to like maybe give them temporary housing? Because first, before they can gain the skill, Danny, yep. they got to have somewhere to live. So as part of your vision, how, how do you go about doing that without raising taxes or, or those types? Yeah, I, I, and it's a great question, Greg. And, and you hit on a very key point, and Danny, you alluded to it a little bit earlier when you asked me, what are some of the big issues? I would throw out to your viewers one of the other giant issues that doesn't get talked about enough in campaigns or in the media is the lack of adequate housing in our community. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming a crisis. Mm -hmm. And the lack of affordable housing. Yes. And there are, a number, there are a number of approaches to it. And we have something called the Bill Sadowski Act at the Florida Legislature uh, up, in, up in Tallahassee. It's a primary source of low-income housing funds and to develop low-income housing. Mm -hmm. The legislature's been raiding that trust fund and that pot of money for, for years and not funding it fully. Um, and that's a dedicated source of funding that should be going to building affordable housing. So I think we need to do a, a better job of lobbying our, our legislators uh, uh, about that issue. I think we need to also understand that, um, well, the housing is a very important part of it, and I think that's something we need to look at as well when we tackle multi-generational poverty. But we also have, have to recognize, along with the housing, and I keep coming back to this, it's also the jobs. You, you've got to have the jobs because you can't work your way out of poverty unless you can do just that, mm -hmm. unless you can work. I think one of the things, and you're right, Danny, we created in this country, and it's nothing that Orange County Public Schools or Seminole County Public Schools or Osceola did or any local school district, or it's, it's, frankly, it's a, it's a product of no child left behind at the federal mm -hmm. level, as Greg knows, mm -hmm. and, and of this state mandate to adopt the dictates of no child left behind, which was legislation that, that, that passed um, in the 80s that, that required a one-size-fits-all curriculum. Mm -hmm. And it's been reformed a number of times or amended. But this country made a tremendous mistake, I think, beginning in the 70s and 80s, moving away from what you and I called and our parents called vocational education right. and going to a one-size-fits-all college preparatory curriculum. You know, among developed countries, and I get very passionate about this, I can talk about this forever, so mm -hmm. forgive me, Greg, I know you're, you're an no, educator, you're good. You're but, good, among, yeah. but among Western civilized countries, and by that I mean Western European countries and, and developed countries in Asia, whether it's Singapore, Hong Kong, China, Korea, Japan, uh, England, France, Germany, you name the country, first world country. We are almost alone in that we are the only country that requires every student to take a college preparatory curriculum all the way up till age 18. And what we're doing, and Greg's the expert on this because he used to be an assistant principal. If you ever go into one of our schools or any school, there are really good kids in those schools who are 16, 17 years old who are going there every day, but you can just see it in their eyes, Danny. They're just punching the clock every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're just waiting their time because they're not bad kids. They're going to graduate, but they know college isn't for them. And right. we're failing those kids. Right. And we're starting to realize that as a country uh, with the most recent iteration of No Child Left Behind, the ESSA Act, Every Student Succeeds Act. We are now emphasizing as national policy, and so much education policy is driven from Washington down, career technical education. We don't even call it vocational ed anymore. We call it career technical education. But I, I will share with your viewers that Orange County Public Schools, my board and myself in particular, I talked about this seven years ago when I ran for this newly created position, Orange County School Board Chair. We have made driving down into the high school classroom more meaningful career technical education opportunities a priority of ours. Used to be seven years ago that if a kid wanted meaningful career technical education, I mean where they can get a certificate, uh, uh, whether it's in an occupational specialty, whether it's an AS degree, they had to get on a bus or frankly they, they weren't even afforded a bus transport. They had to have transportation, mom or dad, get them to a local community college and enroll in the dual enrollment program. It's not the case anymore. We have actually tripled in the last four or five years alone, three, actually four years alone, tripled the number of students getting career technical certificates. We have a guy that Greg, I'm sure, knows because he was with us for many years, Orange County Public Schools, named Mike Armbruster, mm -hmm. who's just done a phenomenal job of bringing the career technical education into the high school classroom. But Danny, I will share with your viewers, 
It's not enough, and it's not enough because we're still handcuffed by federal education policy, and we need to start giving kids the option as early as 14 or 15, I would suggest, because mm -hmm. that's what they do in Europe, and that's what they do in Asia. Give kids the option at 14 or 15 to pursue a career technical track or a college preparatory track. Uh, I lived in Germany as a young boy. Uh, my father was Army. And in Germany, kids at age 14 or so, they elect to either go to the gymnasium, which is a college preparatory track, or the real school, which is a, the vocational track. Mm -hmm. What we have to be careful about, though, and this is something that uh, you know, I'm always very open about uh, what I know and what I don't know. One thing I didn't know when I got elected to the school board chair position was how touchy a subject it is to many minority populations. Because back in the day when we had vocational education, you found disproportionately that in high minority neighborhoods, those children, African-American children, Latino children, were all pushed into vocational tracks and not given the option of the college track. And we have a wonderful superintendent who's an African-American herself, and she's made me very aware of that. So we have to be careful how we do it because we now have high rigor AP courses and honors courses and college level courses in all our schools, whether it's a high minority population school like Jones or Oak Ridge or Colonial, or whether it's a school that has less minorities such as a Winter Park uh, or a, another school. We now offer high rigor AP honors courses and dual enrollment courses in all our schools. And that wasn't the case 10 years ago, Danny. And no, no, knows, no, and it no, wasn't no, no, those were pretty intense courses because my daughter yeah. went to Olympia and I went to a parent conference and I'm like, wow, yeah. oh, I, I, I didn't even understand this stuff. So you're going to continue the uh, tradition because I know that you guys just opened up the ACE Center and then you're doing something in West Orlando. So as uh, mayor for Orlando, will you continue that tradition of working collectively with people like uh, uh, Mr. Harris Rosen? UCF. I think that's one of the great things that Orlando's really done with that downtown area. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, you know, and, and I, I had to chuckle there a moment. I don't know if you saw my smile or Danny, you did. I'm not running against my good friend Buddy Dyer from Mayor of Orlando. <laughs> it's Mayor of Orange County. <laughs> right. It's an open seat. Teresa Jacobs is yeah. term limited out. Oh, okay. I'm not running okay. against Teresa right, Jacobs, okay. another good friend of mine yeah. and uh, someone who I really admire. But yes, and, and I think that we need collaborative leadership, and I think that uh, anybody who's watched Orange County Public Schools and what we've achieved in the last seven mm -hmm. years realizes that I've brought collaborative leadership to, to, to that body. Our graduation rate has gone from 49% 15 years ago to 92% today, 92%. We were named the top urban district in the entire United States of America. We won something called the Broad Prize, which goes to the top nice. urban district. We've been named an AP Honor Roll District, which only goes to 4% of the school districts nationwide based on the percentage of our students not only taking AP courses, but passing AP exams. We've won the Governor Sterling Award for Operational Efficiency and, and, and Customer Service, only the second school district in the history of that award, which is a state award for the equivalent of the Malcolm Baldrige mm -hmm. Award. Only the second school district in the history of that award to, to win it for, for improving our customer service and, and through uh, procurement or bid bid efficiencies, we've saved the taxpayers over $70 million in the last four years alone through more competitive bidding. I didn't do any of that on my own. I did it because I had a great team. Mm -hmm. And that great team were seven other school board members, a wonderful superintendent, a wonderful body of administrators, 13,000 hardworking teachers and 200,000 hardworking students, and over 200,000 parents who are committed to their children's education. We need that same approach, I think, mm -hmm. in county government. And, and I think that, you know, when, when I go out and I talk to audiences, I, I, I share with them that my, my campaign's all about three things, experience, energy, and vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that I bring that experience, uh, I think I've proven that through seven years of the helm of the largest uh, government in Central Florida, the 10th largest school district in the country. We're the largest transportation and food provider in Central Florida. Uh, every day we have uh, close to 1,000 buses on the road transporting 70,000 students safely virtually every day. Provide uh, good, nutritious fare and meals to our students in our schools every day and during the summer and increasingly in the evenings and in many of our schools it's free lunch, free breakfast for all of our children. So my point is we need that collaborative approach and I think we need somebody with experience. I think we've seen in this country what electing somebody with no experience mm -hmm. in government brings to the table. I don't think we mm -hmm. want to repeat that mistake on the local level, but we, we really need to uh, bring, bring, bring someone with experience to this position mm -hmm. of county mayor. Well, I, I wanted to point something out to you because the both of you are in education. Mm -hmm. 
um, our TV program is now in a collaborative uh, partnership with Osceola schools, high schools. Thank you. To bring journalism into the minority community, teach journalism. So students will be coming here to learn journalism in this building um, and will be going to the high schools. We're starting off in Point Siena. Um, that's our first class. We started about two weeks ago. And um, there seems to be a lack of clarity when it comes to journalism in this country. And what we want to do, with, particularly with the minority communities, try to educate them a little bit on clarity and how to decipher what's being fed over the airwaves to determine what the truth is, what's not the truth, what's tainted journalism, so that they get a better vision of knowing how to decipher what's coming over the TV set. So um, we've met with um, Kelvin Soto and um, a group of teachers up in uh, Osceola County to start that program. Mostly um, on, because of the high school that was selected, it's mostly minorities because of the high school that was selected. But that's a weakness in our community also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've started that. It's an interesting program. Maybe somebody in Orange County might be interested in something and doing a collaborative venture with that. Uh, we would. And, yeah. and, uh, oh, and by, just a, one point. Those kids are actually going to be doing their own TV show here. Oh, that's terrific. They'll be learning those skills we talked yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're that's going hands-on skills. Are yeah, important. they're going to do things on that are happening within the school that are socially unacceptable. They're going to be talking about drugs and we're talking about bullying. They're going to be talking about um, relationships between kids. Very open, but at the high school mentality level. But talk show concept like this mm -hmm. is it's going to be really cool. I, I think nice. it's wonderful that you're yeah. doing that, and, and I want to thank you on behalf of, of as a public yeah. education advocate, because mm -hmm. we need those partnerships. I, I, I've always said in my, my years in government and in community service and as a community leader, mm -hmm. big problems are never solved by government alone. It takes a collaborative partnership mm -hmm. approach. Uh, one of the things I'm very proud of at Orange County Public Schools, we have an interfaith initiative where we've invited the Good, faith yeah. community very in. Effective. And, and I, I don't claim credit for that. That's the, all the credit for that is Dr. Barbara Jenkins. That was one of her ideas. But we also have over That's 20, a great idea, though. That's it's a great terrific. idea. Mm -hmm. We have over 20,000 partners in education, uh, which is small businesses mm -hmm. and large businesses alike in Orange County who help our public schools. Uh, we have a great partnership with the Central Florida Hotel Lodging Association. They're a wonderful partner. We have great relationships with our corporate partners where they provide tremendous resources. One of the things I, I do claim credit for is when I got into this position, I, I came to realize, and I stole this idea of all people from Caroline Kennedy in New York City schools, mm -hmm. where she had raised tens of millions of dollars for New York City public schools, that we didn't have a strong foundation and we didn't have a philanthropic plan. We started something under my watch called the Philanthropic Strategic Plan. It was a, an initiative I spearheaded. Uh, we now have a thriving foundation. We have raised close to $30 million from outside sources and partners for Orange County Public Schools to provide the things that state funding doesn't provide and local funding doesn't provide. Well, again, we need to bring that same approach to county government mm -hmm. because whether it's transportation, whether it's housing, whether it's building affordable housing, we're going to have to work in partnership with our affordable housing developers to do that. That's very, very important and with, with the building community. Uh, whether it's um, uh, tackling the causes of poverty and attracting jobs. We're going to have to work hand-in-hand mm -hmm. hand with our economic development partners and with those who go out and, and bring those jobs here. One, so one, it's all about partnerships. Yeah. One, one of our major issues facing Central Florida now is what happened in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. The entire infrastructure of Puerto Rico has collapsed. Um, thousands and thousands of Puerto Ricans who are citizens, actually, they've been citizens since 1917, of the United States um, are flooding into uh, the mainland simply because the companies are out of business because there's no electrical, there's no uh, running water, there's still a disaster area. And I think there are about 800 students, I don't know if it was a month coming in, I think it's one, they said one junior high school per month is coming into Central Florida as far as students goes, every month. Mm -hmm. So it must be 800 students a week because that would be 3,200 students, right? So uh, how, how is the Board of Ed ready to cope with that, to absorb that kind of increase? If it's a school a week, a uh, school a month, you know? It is, and it's been a dramatic input uh, to, to our system in, in a strain. Uh, when we held our first press conference on how we were going to accommodate uh, Hurricane Maria evacuees from Puerto Rico, American citizens who were, who were coming to the mainland to join us as fellow American citizens, and I think that's an important point, Danny. 
I'm glad you said it that way because a lot of folks don't realize these are our fellow Americans that are coming here and we, we owe them what we would owe any fellow American from Georgia, from Texas, from Michigan, from mm -hmm. New York, from anywhere. Uh, when we held our first press conference, which was about two weeks after the hurricane, we had at that time 600 evacuees that had come into our public schools, 600 children, 600 students. We did another event with a state senator with our local delegation uh, about four weeks later. At that time, it was over 2,100 students. As we speak today, it's bumping up over 3,000 students. That's in Orange County Public Schools alone. Now, fortunately for us in Franny School District, um, yes, that is enough students in Orange County alone to fill not one, but two entire middle schools. In mm -hmm. fact, frankly, that would, that would overfill a, a new high school. Yeah. Our prototype high schools are built to accommodate about 2,800 students. Middle schools, about 1,200, 1,250 students, roughly speaking. They're not all uniform. But they're dispersed throughout the county. And we did a plot map where we can take a map of the county and all our schools and where the a little dot for each mm -hmm. child. Uh, where they're residing and, and we also had a, a, a chart that we have that I could be happy to provide you with. And, and they range from some schools have gone as many as 40 or 50 students and don't get me wrong, that's a tremendous impact on a school because that's two full teachers, two new classrooms that need to be accommodated. Um, but most schools are getting anywhere from 10 to 20 new students to date. Uh, one of the things that we've had to do is ask the legislature to say, hey, you know, the funding should come with those kids. A lot of folks, this is lost on them. But in public education, our funding flows directly from the state on a per student basis. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, State Department of Education so far has not been willing to go in and do what we call an interim count right now to give us funding now for this semester. They're saying they're going to go in and do a count in January. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help us now. Yeah. Uh, because each kid takes about $7,200 per year to educate, and that's a tremendous strain on us. Bill, and our we are out of time. Already? <laughs> yeah. That, that, oh, yeah. It flew. We, it flew. Are you it? sure? Okay. Yeah, this is, uh, Thank you, we're Danny. out of time, but I want you to come back because education, particularly on Greg's show. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, well, education, to. just education. to talk about the yeah. educational issues because that's such an important specialty for our communities, you know? So we'd love for you to come back anytime you guys can hook up and get together. Sure. You know? sure. This is Danny Ramos on Hispanic Speak Out. We will see you next week. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much for coming. Thank, Thank you, you. Danny. Greg, Thank you, sir. Good seeing you. Thank mm -hmm. you. for the child who's had seven addresses in a single year because she's in foster care, because her father abused her. And her mother? Her mother couldn't believe her. She is the child I am for. I am a volunteer child advocate. I am you. Florida residents call toll-free 866-341-1425. Step up to craft beer. Taino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing, Caribbean-style flavor. Boricua Craft Ale, full-bodied flavor for the true beer drinker. Stop drinking beer water. Taino Craft Light Lager and Boricua Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm and come up to craft beer. Tap rooms are localized and they're geographic. The Hispanic community is much broader than one tap room. So what we decided to do was come out with a high quality craft beer, two high quality craft beers that appeal to the Hispanic taste and that we can distribute in all the Hispanic neighborhoods. Taino is a very light, refreshing beer. It's a, it's a social beer that you can drink probably for a good part of the evening and it'll give you a nice light feeling. It's not a heavy beer, it's very airy and it's very light. It's a 4.5 alcohol, which is low for beer. The Boricua is a 6.0. Now that's a stronger beer and we designed it to be a little bit stronger than Heineken. Heineken is a favorite in the Hispanic community, so we have a little bit more muscle than Heineken. Boricua, Boricua right now, in a very short amount of time, it's been a miracle for us because we've gotten a, a large range of acceptance at the retail level. We're in Publix, we're in ABC, Target is picking it up, we're in Sedano's, we're in Bravo's, 7-Elevens are picking it up because they're concentrating more on craft beer and the Hispanic market. So what we're trying to do is do a quality beer, a high quality beer, more taste, and that the Hispanic community will like. Step up to craft beer. Taino Light Lager has a crisp, refreshing, Caribbean-style flavor. Boricua Craft Ale, full-bodied flavor for the true beer drinker. 
Stop drinking beer water. Taino Craft Light Lager and Boricua Strong Craft Ale. Feel the rhythm and come up to craft beer.